Buonasera a tutti. Benvenuti a Giovedì Scienza, benvenuti a Welcome to Giovedì Scienza Science on a Thursday. Welcome to the Colosseum Theatre. And I would like to invite our, a gong player. We only have one this evening to come and sit down on one of the two chairs. We only found one for the time being, only one volunteer, but if there's anyone who would like to join him, you're welcome. There's still one place, so we're going to ask him to try the mic and introduce himself. Uh, sono Paolo, uh, um, qua a Torino, my name is Paolo, and I'm studying industrial biotechnology here in Turin. So I should understand something this evening. I hope so. We imagine that you will. And let's try the gong. Un colpo secco. Perfetto. Allora, io vi dico ancora una comunicazione. No, anzi, beh, spieghiamo che cosa serve. And now let's explain what the gong is for. Our friend Paolo will have the opportunity to interrupt at any time the conference to ask a question, clearly referring to the topic. It's a surprise question once and only once. Then we forget it, and so he will surprise us. Now, I'm going to sit down to next uh, to Piero Bianucci, whom you well know, to introduce and welcome our guest. Our guest is Pier Paolo Pandolfi. He is a molecular genetist and a cancer specialist and oncologist, but we will also discover that uh, was, is, uh, many other things too. He manages a research center for research and treatment of cancer in Boston. He is a professor at Harvard, but also at the University of Turin, where he teaches molecular biology. He has been awarded more than 30 prizes and awards. 34, 34. But initially he started out as a philosopher, Piero. You've known him for a long time. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that if you key in Pierpaolo Pandolfi and you go to see how many quotations you have and you look at the graph, say, for the past 10 years, you will discover that he is one of the scientists that is most quoted in the world in his field. And his name is outstanding. And we know him less well than he than in the US. So I'm very pleased to, to have him here in Italy with us. So, so please key in through Google Pier Paolo Pandolfi. There are thousands and thousands a year, regularly, every year. So it is a an ongoing top career. This said, the curious thing is that initially Pierpaolo Pandolfi didn't think that he was going to be a scientist. In fact, he was attracted by arts and humanities and philosophy. So before beginning his presentation, uh, which is the topic this evening, that is to say how we can play with genes um, on the gene chessboard to uh, beat cancer. I'd like to know how you started. Good evening to you all. Well, first of all, my career is rather unusual. I started, I was, uh, my parents um, uh, were university professor and they taught a Serbo-Croatian literature and French uh, literature at, in Italy, in Rome, and uh, uh, then abroad. And I grew up uh, with the bread and philosophy, bread and books, uh, and uh, I had decided that I would be a philosopher. I then uh, started uh, studying philosophy in Rome and then played the piano right up to year five. And I just read, I just read, read, read. In fact, when I was a child, I was uh, in being taken of the fact that I had to read all the classics, so I was reading them one after the other after the other. And at a certain point in the course of my uh, 
studies, uh, I had a crisis in spite of the fact that I liked and I still do like philosophy so much so that when I was in Boston, I wondered whether it was possible to have to start a PhD in philosophy, but then I failed because I have too much to do in other fields and there's a lot to do, a lot of wonderful things to do in science, but at a certain point I switched. And not only did I decide to uh, start medicine, but uh, in a rather crazy manner I decided to uh, be to study medicine in spite of the fact I knew that I wanted to be a scientist. My parents were rather puzzled, first of all, because I was taking a long time, I was an eternal student, and because basically they didn't like the idea that I would uh, relinquish uh, the humanities, uh, and they didn't quite understand why I wanted to be a doctor, having, mean, having decided I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, because a doctor, one think, is a person who treats uh, and therefore works uh, hands-on, while scientists carry out research. Yes, scientists carry out research while, the, while doctors, medical doctors, apply this and uh, treat diseases. In the end, I was both, but I immediately decided that I was going to work uh, in a lab uh, carrying out experiments, and in the last year of medicine, uh, changed, something happened that changed my life, because we discovered the genes of a leukemia, which was then a killer, and uh, understand the genetics, as I will explain in my presentation, this uh, uh, we were able to treat, cure this uh, leukemia. So in the last year of medicine, I had this incredible event, and two years later, I was in New York uh, um, leading the first research group of the Americans uh, were very courageous, uh, they, as if uh, they'd given uh, the child a Ferrari, and I was uh, overwhelmed because I had very little experience. I was a medical student, and suddenly I was uh, the director of a lab in New York, but in the end we were successful. We defeated leukemia and uh, many other discoveries. At a certain point, Harvard University, which is uh, the top of the mountain, as they say, in the Americas, because they think that it's the top of the top, uh, this is the great university in the world, the Americans are unquestionably full of themselves, but um, Harvard called me in 2007 and uh, we went. Here I would like to make two comments. First of all, is that sometimes you uh, appear to be losing time, but in fact you're gaining time. And the second comment uh, is uh, that Americans uh, with uh, all their faults have a great uh, plus. That is to say that when they see someone who's professionally able, who can compete in intelligence, they immediately uh, recognize it. And this doesn't always happen in Italy, especially it doesn't happen with young people. We think that first of all they have to be seasoned and then they have to become intelligent, while in fact it's the other way around. Youngsters are intelligent and then they acquire experience. Yes, you have to point on youth and Put your, put your chips on youth and foreigners. Uh, in this, uh, the U.S. are very open. Uh, but they understand Italians uh, also in terms of sport and music. Uh, uh, so, for example, what about the Scala? That we are opening up uh, in Italy, and in fact, the Scala is going to be directed uh, by a foreigner, but. Uh, in fact, uh, the Americans um, treat uh, science as if it were a football team. Take the best, uh, and uh, if Alberto will allow me, I have two questions. Uh, yes, you have permission. First one is, uh, how did you manage for so many years to be so high up in the H index, in, uh, in Google Scholar, wherever you want? How did you manage that? Because I believe that at this point uh, you have to be 
good, but you also have to have a very good team. Yes, certainly you need talent and creativity, but uh, what has made it possible for me to remain at a certain level to this to date is the fact that I want to cure cancer and I will not give up uh, until we've been successful. And this is such a strong drive uh, that uh, we publish well, but not simply because we want to publish, but because we're all extremely motivated, all the group, about 5,000 people in my cancer center, 40 people in my lab. We all work day in, day out, and all day, all night to cure cancer. And when you work with that sort of enthusiasm, you make important discoveries, and this makes you young. Last question. The relationship between Pier Paolo Pandolfi and Turin, because it is true that he's nearly always there, but sometimes he is here. Yes, I had this privilege of being called the same year I was called at Harvard. The University of Turin called me. That was 2007, and we have a wonderful relationship with the city, with the university, with my colleagues who have also become my friends. I feel at home. I basically feel at home. I'm Roman. You can probably, uh, when I speak uh, quickly, you can hear I'm a Roman. But this is my home. I love the city. And uh, Turin recalls me, recalls Boston. It's a very refined, uh, well educated, cultured city. And I'm very pleased to be here this evening, here with you in Turin. And now, and now, without any further ado, we'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Allora, quello che cercherò di fare stasera è soprattutto tenere caldo. What I'm going to try and do. Ce la, ce la metterò tutta, I ma soprattutto voglio would like to convey the enthusiasm, the joy and beauty for this moment. Cancer is a terrible disease. The world is going through a very difficult moment. The United States is going through a very difficult moment, as is Italy. But there is an enormous enthusiasm in what we're doing. And this keeps us going. In fact, I will be talking about the biomedical revolution, uh, which uh, virtually has turned around the way in which we diagnose cancer and diseases, and we know that we will be able to defeat it. This revolution will make it possible for us uh, to develop an ultra-precise uh, medicine. Why did we develop this term ultra-precise? Well, it's new. I'll get to it. I'll be talking about four points, and I will be leaving you with some bullet points, uh, which I hope you will take back with you. That, in first of all, enthusiasm and the opportunity and the challenge um, which we have uh, and the duty. And the question is, uh, there are two questions which are extremely simple but very important uh, and uh, that are lie within me. Can we defeat cancer? And I will try and convince you that yes, it is possible. And if we can, can we relieve the suffering that is associated with uh, our aging and decline, because cancer is a pathology of aging. I would like to start with enthusiasm. As all of you, enth enthusiasm and oncology uh, may seem to be juxtaposed or oxymoron, uh, but uh, there is, in fact, real enthusiasm. We see it in the eyes of those who are working there, in the eyes of the cancer specialists, the researchers. We see it in the eyes and smiles of our patients. The reason why we're enthusiastic is because we are at long last defeating the disease, and we're defeating the disease on the basis of three basic revolutionary turning points, uh, which, have, which took place in the past five, 10 years. And I will try to give you an overview and a timeline of these changes. You should remember that cancer is a disease that has always been there in ancient Greece, uh, in ancient Rome. The word tumor is a Greek word, and uh, we are defeating it uh, on the basis uh, of uh, a technological and conceptual revolution that has taken place in the past five years. 3,000 years, five years. And I will 
show you what this makes, makes possible. The first fundamental point or key point uh, is that we have at long last understood the logic of the disease, its rules and its molecular basis, which is why we can play a chess game with cancer. We know what move with the next move is going to be, for instance. And this has radically changed uh, the treatment and the way in which we deal with the disease. Uh, you all know what chemotherapy is, or what radiotherapy is. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy are the logical outcome of the only thing that, only thing that we used to know about cancer in the I'm to referring to the last century, and maybe even the Romans and Greeks knew about it. Cancer is a disease whereby the cells of our body start proliferating in, in aberration. And this is all we knew about cancer up to 30 years ago. The only observation that made it possible that had we used drugs, chemotherapy, or physical agents uh, such as radiotherapy to attack uh, the quick, quickly proliferating cells, we would have beaten it. Uh, but radiotherapy and chemotherapy gave uh, some advantages. Uh, oh, we have defeated some cancers uh, and delayed uh, the demise in others, uh, but we didn't f really win. We know that uh, chemo and radiotherapy have major side effects, uh, so much so because uh, they attack uh, proliferating cells. And in our bodies, uh, there are a lot of them, uh, our skin, our hair, um, our blood. So these treatments uh, are not specific. Uh, they affect uh, all uh, the cells. The reason why we'd be using these treatments is because we didn't know what the molecular fault was uh, triggering uh, uh, the crazy development of the cells. So the only thing that we could do was to uh, attack cancer with this. Uh, but the idea is, uh, was that we were fighting a war because uh, radio and chemotherapy are like bombing, so much so that the Nixon administration in 1970 signed a declaration of war against cancer, the war on cancer. The issue, though, is, is when you have a war, we don't really understand our enemy, and that's why we fight a war. Otherwise, we would have negotiation. Otherwise, we would agree on something. There's no reason to bomb each other. You can agree. Each other. But bombing is the only thing that you can do if there's no understanding. So the treatment that we're doing now is a no longer bombing, but it is negotiation. And the reason why we negotiate with cancer is because now we understand uh, what the cancer cells are doing. And uh, another example, which I would like uh, you to bear in mind, if the car breaks down and you don't know how the engine works, the only thing that you can do is uh, buy another one or scrap it. But if you understand, you know what the details of how the engine works, uh, uh, then you can, I don't know, uh, mend one part, change a part, and this is what we're doing now, because we're now understanding what is happening. The first thing that we understood, because uh, the things that we've understood, it seems very complex, but in fact they're very simple. We understood that the reason why these cells go mad is uh, because they accumulate mutations uh, within the gene world, and this, uh, it's as if uh, you had a part uh, or your uh, the car uh, broke down and suddenly your cells were proliferating. So uh, since we know what genes are mutating and we know what the mechanism is, uh, we can develop uh, drugs that are intelligence uh, dr targeted drugs uh, uh, that mend the spare part that broke down. The other thing that we understood, we have understood over time in the past 30 years uh, is uh, that cancer is not all the same, it's not one. There are many types of cancer or tumor, for example, breast cancer, other cancers, uh, and these uh, are associated to very specific mutation. Type A with a gene A, B gene, B mutation, and so on. And this has made it possible to follow a very precise 
route. That is to say that if we want to mend it, we have to be person uh, personal and targeted and uh, customized, so to speak. For example, if you have a red cancer, you can't uh, use the yellow solution and so on. If you can't change the wrong spare part. The other thing that we have learned over time and recently is that cancer in the same body evolved. Uh, in fact, uh, it tends to evolve, and if we let it be, it acquires or develops uh, further mutations. So if we go back to the color scheme, red, yellow, and blue, at a certain point, uh, we may have uh, a cancer which will be mutated for one gene, another gene, or a mixture. And uh, this uh, tells you another important thing, and that is uh, that the sooner we diagnose it, the better it is. Uh, early diagnosis uh, means it won't evolve, but if it evolves, uh, uh, the logic has to be that not only has a, do we have to have a tailored treatment, but we have to use combination drugs, uh, a cocktail of drugs, because we have uh, we have to have a drug for the red, for the yellow, and for the blue cells. If we have early diagnosis, the problem will not exist because at that point, usually, we can, get, we can use one drug. The second revolutionary aspect, uh, and I will give you the uh, timeline another moment, is that so far we have uh, developed uh, knowledge tools that were previously unmanageable. The first one that we have is uh, this uh, mega microscope or telescope. It depends if you're looking at it from inside or from outside. Uh, astronomers are looking out uh, while we look in. This. Uh, ability to sequence uh, our genome, uh, our genome, and that is to say the book of life, to read all the words, the volume of uh, the books of life, like I wanted to do naively when I was a youngster, reading all the books and all the classics of literature. And to give you an idea of the type of acceleration here, look at this. Uh, the first uh, book of life, the first genome, required five years' work uh, uh, from 1998 to 2003. So we're talking about uh, very recent times, in any case, five years' work, so 5,000 people, and the cost uh, was $3 billion. Uh, this, but if you then compare it uh, to what we're able to do now, the acceleration has been incredible. We can sequence millions of genomes of all human beings in less than 15 minutes using one researcher, because it's all automated, for a cost of about uh, 300, 300, 200, 300 euros. Uh, that's the cost of a blood test or urine test, if you it roughly cost that. For the same sum of money, for 300 euros, we can sequence the whole genome. We could do it for all human beings, for all cancers, for all the tumors. So, and it has really been a revolution and an evolution. And I'm like to show you, I like showing you this slide. Uh, because uh, not only to warm you up, because this gentleman is a harbinger of what has happened. This gentleman is a loony mad person called Ozzy Osbourne, and he is the leader of the Black Sabbath, one of the most aggressive uh, bands, rock bands, I think, an American rock band. But the gentleman is a forerunner because he decided to sequence his genome, and he decided to do it uh, to know why he's still alive, in spite of the fact uh, that he tried all possible drugs uh, and smoked and injected all the possible substances, but he's still alive. So he asked himself, uh, how is it possible that I am still alive? And so he got his genome sequenced. Although this is absurd, in fact, it's a very interesting story because a genome, our book of life, uh, is something that we can sequence for cancer when the cancer has developed, but we can also 
sequence it in people who are not ill. And for example, Ozzy Osbourne had something very important, asking himself, if I am exposed, for example, to cigarette smoke, uh, three packets a day, and or if I was in Chernobyl and I didn't get cancer, does that mean that I have something in my body that makes me resistant to tumor? And by sequencing it, we will understand not only why tumors come, but also be why it doesn't come. And therefore, to be able to predict the risk of tumor is very important. All this is happening now. This is not science fiction. We can sequence them in all patients. And this makes it possible for us to change the way in which we diagnose it. This is why we call it a microscopic genome so far. It has been, tumors have been diagnosed looking uh, with a microscope and, for example, pathologists said this is breast cancer, so on and so forth. But from now on, diagnosis will be morphological diagnosis, but also at the level of the genome, because we will know exactly what type of mutations that cancer has, to say this is a prostate cancer with this and that and the other uh, mutation. And this uh, has uh, changed the way in which we do our pathologists. We use opt light microscopy, but we also use uh, uh, the genome and other micro microscopes. So the other beautiful and thing uh, which has happened uh, is that since uh, we can read the genome from A to Z, we can also read the transcriptoma, that is to say, how it becomes an RNA copy, and I will be showing you what we discovered by doing this. This has made it possible for us to discover, and we're talking about cancer but also other pathologies, there was something that we couldn't see even five years ago. As I was saying, in 1998, uh, the first genome, the first book of life, uh, was sequenced. Uh, and uh, what left people puzzled uh, was that when we started counting how many genes there was in the, within this enormous genome, it was roughly 20,000. Now, I would like to remind you what a gene is. Maybe you will remember from the studies at school or even at junior high school, a classical gene is a piece of DNA which is copied in RNA and then produces a protein. This is what we thought genes were five, ten years ago. When we counted it, our genome only had 20,000. Uh, and what left everybody a little puzzled is that these 20,000 genes uh, occupied a very small space, only 2%. Uh, and the question was, uh, what about all the rest of it? What about the remaining 98%? Why have we got such a big genome? And someone said, well, maybe because uh, this uh, is the regulating uh, the 20,000 genes. Possible. And surely it is true. But then we realized something else. Since we were sequencing faster and faster, and we were starting sequencing the genes of potatoes, tomatoes, and so on, what emerged was that tomatoes have twice as many genes as humans. So at that point, somebody said, well, wait a minute, there's something that's not right here. Because if tomatoes have 40,000 protein codeine genes, a tomato is a tomato with due respect. Tomatoes are a little bit simpler than what we are as complex and thinking beings. Uh, so at this point, uh, the field uh, started splitting because there were those who were saying, well, yes, with the 20,000 genes that we have, we have the ability to regulate them very specifically. Imagine that you are painters uh, and you're painting. At this point, you have colors and a brush. Leonardo certainly painted very well with those colors and that brush. If, those, if you give it to me, well, I will not be able to do what Leonardo 
Armado did. Uh, and this uh, is what we thought up to five, ten years ago. That is to say that all this enormous piece of the genome was simply there to give a fine regulation of these genes as if they were tweaking them or as if uh, they were a paintbrush and we were painting. While when we started to sequence all the genome, all the transcriptome, we realized uh, that there was a situation uh, that was really uh, surprising, as if we were looking at the book of life and we'd seen the dark uh, DNA, black holes and galaxies. Uh, we saw that this uh, remaining part uh, of the pie is uh, scattered by with the uh, different types of genes, uh, genes uh, that produce RNA but don't uh, code proteins. These are as important, uh, as functional. They work uh, to control embryo development, cancer. They can also be subject uh, to the development of new, they can help to develop new th treatment, uh, and we're still counting them, but to give you uh, an idea of them, it, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of new genes, uh, and uh, we know three things for the time being uh, that can be very small. We call them microRNA. Uh, they can be long RNAs, but they can also be of two different species. Uh, they can be linear, like a little sp spaghetti with a beginning and an end, but also circular. And though we don't know what these hundreds of thousands uh, of RNAs or genes and uh, ge circular linear RNAs, we know that they're involved in the disease. We know through the work uh, that we do that they can cause cancer. Now, faced with that, uh, because this has all happened in the past five years, uh, this bewildering situation, you can have uh, different reactions, three different ways of reacting. There are people who deny their negationists. They say it's not possible. This is all bollocks. Uh, not possible that for decades we studied the 20,000 genes. Uh, we were, it's not possible that we were wrong. There are those like me who are over-enthusiastic. Enthusi we've got in front of us uh, a space of knowledge that is incredible. And then those who get completely depressed and say it's not possible. We have to study all these genes again, starting from scratch. I get very emotional about all, about all this. And to go back to the book, of life, uh, if you didn't like the apple pie, it's as if we had obsessively read the same book, uh, the book uh, which uh, is the protein coding one, and we'd forgotten to read the other books. Uh, and now we have to read the other books, uh, because the other books uh, are as interesting. And this uh, has forced us uh, to rethink uh, uh, the fact that we are accurate and precise. I don't know if you read in the paper that uh, the, the, we're now talking about precision disease. For years we said we were precise, but how can you be precise uh, if you're only using 2% of our genome? So we decided to invent a new definition, and the new definition is uh, ultra-precision medicine where all that information is taken into consideration. So not only have we invented a new term, but we've invented a new movement, a new cultural movement that we have called 98 plus 2. To say that we want to study the whole genome, transcriptome, Me Too movement towards ultra-precision. Why do we say Me Too? Because slowly now everybody wants to join uh, the Me Too whole genome transcriptome project because they've realized that otherwise they lag behind. The third and last point, um, the revolutionary point uh, through which uh, uh, we are about to and will defeat cancer is that at long last we have understood how cancer avoids uh, the immune system. Now, our immune system is made to fight uh, anything that is not us bacteria, viruses, uh, so on, anything that enters as a foreign body in our body. For years, the scientists have tried to understand why cancer was never identified as a foreign body, it was not identified as a foreign body, it was not seen. 
and for years immunologists uh, uh, were made fun of because everybody was saying you will never manage, you will never manage. And in the end, they cracked the code altogether. We did. We understood why and this has made it possible to develop a new oncological medicine which in America we call a cure within, where we use drugs to trigger the immune system attacking cancer as if it were a bacterium or a virus. And what we've understood, or they have understood, the pioneers, I don't know if you know that this year the Nobel Prize went to immune cancer therapy. These pioneers understood that the immune system is um, attracted by the cancer using three very simple m mechanisms. The cancer becomes uh, invisible like a stealth plane, one of these nasty stealth planes that you have. Then it can reject uh, the immune cells and convince them not to attack by producing certain substances. And in fact, it can convince very slyly the immune cells to cooperate with them. That is to say, instead of attacking, they use it, the cancer uses them, them for its own aims. And this, uh, once you've understood it, uh, makes it possible for us uh, to uh, lower the shield of the stealth, and at that point uh, we can call on the immune cells to destroy the cancer, which means that we can develop uh, an immune treatment of cancer and vaccines, vaccines uh, which are to be used to avoid cancer and uh, to prevent it. These three revolutionary aspects, that is to say the fact that we've understood the molecular logic, we've been playing chess with cancer, the fact that we're able to sequence all the genome and all the transcriptome and that we have a new tool, that is to say immune treatment, creates an opportunity and an opportunity is clear to you all, we have to defeat cancer now because we have the tools now, the right tools. We have very many targeted smart drugs. I'm talking about hundreds of new drugs. And I would saying this, and I say it again and again, this is what gives us hope. Our cancer patients must have hope because every day, maybe the good day, and maybe they will, it'll be the day of a cancer drug that will be useful for them. But this opportunity creates uh, a challenge. And if you've followed me so far, you will understand what the challenge is. Uh, if I say there's not one cancer, but there are hundreds of cancers, uh, and this means uh, that we need a lot of intelligent or smart drugs. Uh, and how do we ha test them? And there's some that have to be tested in combination because we won't be able to deal with it with one drug. So the question that must arise is how long will it be? How long will it take? Because we need combinations of cancer and we want to treat cancer very quickly. So what the challenge of complexity, of the complexity of this disease uh, has made it possible or forced us um, to create um, new technologies, uh, new facilities, and new approaches uh, to rapidly test uh, these drugs. Uh, and this approach, uh, which uh, we call the co-clinical or the uh, man-mouse uh, relay, because that is how it's been described in very many articles uh, by Arnaldo D'Amico, who's a journalist that has been following us, uh, this approach, I was saying, that I will show you in a moment, uh, if you have patient, uh, comes uh, from a very beautiful story of this leukemia that 30 years ago was a killer and that we defeated a leukemia that was uh, defeated by using mouse models. And I can't. Uh, avoid showing you the cover of this book, this book uh, which I 
edited uh, with Peter Vogt. It's a scientific book uh, that is already out of date. In fact, we have a new edition coming out. I'm not showing you because you have to buy it and read it because it is outdated. I'm simply showing it to you because I want to show you the cover because uh, I'm very proud to date uh, of having convinced uh, Springer, the publisher, to put on the cover a drawing which my daughter had made, Chiara, when uh, she was five. Uh, and we were in New York still, and uh, it was a Sunday, and I came back in the afternoon, and my daughter, who now is uh, a future doctor, so she's at the medical school, my daughter looked at me, and she was angry, and she said, Daddy, why are you never home? Why are you always in a lab? And so I was struck by it, uh, and I said, Chiara, I'll tell you, sit down. I'll tell you what we're doing in the lab and why Dad is, is always working so much. And she took notes. Uh, but the notes uh, were, at that time, uh, drawings and a piece of paper, which I still have. And this is the PowerPoint version of my daughter's uh, uh, drawing when she was five. And in her naiveness, uh, this uh, drawing has the ability to capture all the main crossroads uh, of this, uh, which started uh, uh, with the patient but ended with the cure by defeating this leukemia. And the story went very quickly in this way. We found the genes of this leukemia, as I mentioned. It discovered in my last year at medicine when I was still a student. Uh, so it, I had this discovery which uh, changed my life. Um, uh, suddenly appear, and then looking at it, we realized that this uh, leukemia was of different types. So there was a, 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 B, C, what I said before. But the difference is that 30 years ago, we didn't know about that. We didn't yet know that cancer was differentiated different. Uh, and we realized it, and we asked ourselves, first of all, what do these mutated genes do? And then we decided to put them inside a mouse uh, to see whether they caused uh, leukemia. Uh, we put uh, A, B, and C. And in a nutshell, the mice developed the same type of leukemia of the patient, exactly the same. The pathologist uh, was uh, no longer able to tell the human from the mouse leukemia. At that point, we realized uh, that very simply that if these mice uh, are a repeat what the human tumor is, maybe we can use them uh, to test new treatment, maybe we can cure them, and if we cure them, uh, maybe the same drugs will work in human beings, and that's what we did. We used the various mice. We gave them a drug, an experimental drug, another experimental drug. We tried combining them. And when we realized that they worked in one subtype and not in the other, then we found combinations that worked also in the others. We started to uh, treat them on humans. And by so doing, we defeated that leukemia to say that patients are given one cocktail, two drugs together. Uh, arsenic and retinoic acid, uh, that is a derivative of vitamin A. We can talk about what happens with vitamin A when we have questions. Uh, and this combination defeated, uh, cured, treated one type. And in the other type, uh, uh, we had a new experimental drug, which uh, has a very complicated name, so I won't give you the name, but which uh, was effective. And all of this uh, happened in mice. Once we found these drugs, we convinced the clinicians to go on with clinical trials, and the clinical trials proved that these the combination drugs were effective. And to show you the impact, the media impact, you can see it. This is the percentage of patients who used to survive. 100% of the patients, if they didn't receive a transplant, died. Now survival is 100%. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, and you're diagnosed uh, with a genomic test. Uh, I was telling you that uh, gen the genome will replace uh, the microscope. Uh, and uh, it is then uh, attributed to a certain subtype. Uh, we then combine the patients uh, uh, to a certain number of patients. And they go home and they're cured. They don't ha they're not just treated. They're cured without they discontinue the drug, which is the definition the formal definition of uh, when you're cured, you are cured 
cured when you finish the treatment. You don't, uh, you're not cured when you're still in treatment, but you're in remission. I can say what I, we can talk about managing cancer, uh, but on another occasion, this is not only great triumph, uh, something which has really changed my life, but um, this uh, has in fact, uh, plotted a journey. In fact, we now know that all tumors uh, or cancers are genetically differentiated, and not only, for example, prostate, brain, uh, breast, uh, uh, all of them, not just leukemia, but we also know how to develop models uh, much better than we did before. All the things that we did for leukemia is something that we didn't even know at the beginning, whether putting a human gene in the mouse, the mouse would have ever developed to leukemia. Now not only do we know it, but we know how to do it in all types of cancer. And as I said, we have very many new drugs to test. So when I went to Harvard 10 years ago, we locked ourselves in a room for a week, which is sometimes useful to try and think. And we said, how? Can we do this again, replicate this? It was um, incredible, amazing, but without taking 20 years in this case. What I didn't tell you is that when my daughter was, did this was five, but we treated leukemia 20 years later. And why did it take us 20 years? Because to have the preclinical trials in mice and then the tr clinical trials, uh, you take a long time. And we don't want to wait another 30 years uh, to try all these combination drugs. Uh, maybe it would take us 100, in fact. So we, as I said, we locked ourselves up in a room, in an office, uh, and thought uh, for a week. And uh, we thought how we could develop a platform to treat, uh, or to test, uh, sorry, uh, the various drugs. The first thing is uh, that we thought we needed a new facility. And uh, we called it uh, the Mospital, the Mouse Hospital. Uh, so the Mospital versus a hospital. Uh, because hospital is for human, and hospital is for mouse hospital, is a, an incredible facility where we can offer the mouse, uh, the cancer diseased mouse, all the technology that you would offer a human uh, patient with cancer. Even more, we can do imaging, uh, CT scans, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, x-rays. We can measure their pressure, everything, creating a facility which is exactly the same as the humans, just as the reporters couldn't believe from the New York Times, the reporter from the New York Times couldn't believe it, because uh, if you don't see it, you don't believe it. So I suggest that you should visit it. It's in Boston, but we have a facility. It has a pharmacy, too, for a mouse patho there are mouse pathologists, there are mouse, mouse surgeons and physiotherapists. And then we you decided to use this facility, which is a very standardized, to have uh, this uh, famous uh, relay from uh, uh, mouse to human, the co-clinical trial project. Uh, which I'm going to show you in one slide. The idea is very simple and straightforward. Since there are many drugs, and since uh, we desperately need to understand which drug works in which uh, subtype of uh, cancer, which combination for which patient, we decide to align the human and mouse hospitals uh, using an approach. So if a experimental drug is tested in a human a clinical trial, it is also tried in the mouse hospital. And uh, uh, all these uh, uh, different mice uh, uh, are tested with the same type of uh, uh, cancer. And then there are another two things when possible. We can create, a, we can replicate the same cancer of the patient. Imagine Mr. Smith, who goes to the hospital, is diagnosed to have prostate cancer. We can there create a genetic uh, replica of uh, that particular cancer 
And we can also take Mr. Rossi's cancer, that exact cancer, and create small organoids into in vitro, which grow very quickly. And then we can put those organoids in a mouse, creating an avatar cancer of Mr. Smith. And so while Mr. Smith is performing his therapy or is being treated, at the same time, synchronously, we test the same drugs on all these mice and all the organoids. And the idea is to understand very, very quickly, first of all, that whether Mr. Rossi or Mr. Smith will answer that treatment, but what type of cancer will answer what drug, uh, moving the information back and forth, that is to say, transferring all we learn in the mouse hospital or in the hospital to the hospital and vice versa. Once again, this is not science fiction. This is what is happening now. This is what we're doing now. And I haven't got time to show you, but by using this approach, we found a combination of drugs uh, which is very powerful, very effective in another type of leukemia. And we're hoping that this will be another leap forward, another repeat, uh, a combination of drugs uh, that works for other cancer, such as the prostate one. Another point which I would like to leave you with, not only is this not science fiction, but we're trying to offer it to all patients. Uh, we're not only doing it for some. You'll have to ask me, who's going to pay for all of this? And who's all of this? Well, donors are paying. Think about it. All this, all the things that we're doing is experimental, which means that it cannot be refunded. It can't be refunded by the insurance companies or the national health com uh, systems. So we are using this, and it's paid by donations. And in Italy, when you, for example, donate to one of the foundations, it's the same thing. So what we're offering our patients uh, is a journey of ultra-precision. Going back to the definition of ultra-precision, we're trying to sequence DNA and RNA as a whole in all patients. We're also trying to offer our patients organized immune treatment, vaccines, and the mouse hospital, uh, the hospital, which we're developing, we're developing new drugs uh, so that they become standard of cure. We want to defeat cancer. I've nearly finished, uh, and I hope that I have convinced you of why we're enthusiastic about it. We're convinced uh, that cancer can be defeated because uh, we have done it. Uh, we're convinced also that uh, we can alleviate uh, sufferances of this terrible disease, and all this leads us uh, uh, to a duty, a moral duty, which I feel very strongly. That is to say, the uh, duty to defeat this disease, which is why we want to become the standard of cure. That is to say, why we want to, it to be for everyone. This is why my youngsters, my team works day and night, and this is the reason why we have a citation index that's so high. We have a citation index because we want to cure cancer, because publishing is very important for us, but it's even more important for us. Now, many people ask us, um, and ask me continuously, how long will it take? And many of my colleagues don't want to answer because they think that this is not a legitimate question. I've always thought that it is not only a legitimate question, but it's an, a question we have to answer to. We have to answer to it because we spent a lot of money on cancer research, and we have to answer because patients uh, we owe it to patients, um, and my answer is uh, that we're doing it day after day. I've already said it. The reason why as cancer patients must trust, must have trust, and must not try to fight, uh, not just because life is beautiful, but because extra every extra day might be the day when a new treatment is discovered. It might be effective for your cancer, for the cancer of the patient. Uh, now, I've finished, but since I spoke about Nixon, and since I could malign Trump, which is pretty, Trump, which is pretty self-evident, I would like to close reading or trying to read, because certainly you can't read it from there, 
what is uh, written in this magnificent museum uh, devoted to a very important uh, uh, U.S. President, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, whom, as you know, was uh, murdered uh, in 1963. J the JFK Museum is splendid, it's wonderful, it's a very beautiful building on a, a wonderful peninsula. And if you go in at the entrance, uh, uh, you can see that there are these words that JFK pronounced uh, in his inaugural speech, uh, which took place the 20th of January of uh, 1961. I wasn't born then, and these words are tragic because JFK was then killed two years after. But what JFK says here is, and as you know, he was a visionary. He says that he doesn't know if what we are finding out we will be able to do it in a hundred days or I don't even know if we will be able to do it in the next thousand days and I don't really know if we will ever manage to do it in the time which we will spend on this earth but this doesn't mean we shouldn't start that we shouldn't start doing it now which is exactly what we're doing so let us begin which is what we're doing to defeat cancer thank you <laughs> well, nearly beyond, what, but I, I didn't want to interrupt, uh, you know, and then he was so clear. I would like to ask you, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the work you've done in your career and your enthusiasm, but talking about enthusiasm, as far as medicine is concerned, and the so-called personalized medicine, I, I am also have a certain degree of realism. This, in the end, has, has very high costs. You've explained the type of funding and so on, but if, it's going to be, if we're going to defeat cancer on a mass level, which is the most important thing, that everybody should benefit from it, uh, uh, these uh, treatments uh, must become um, uh, the standard cure. They can't always be based on uh, donations. Uh, at that point, uh, I think, uh, as uh, you've shown us, it is a very expensive uh, form of treatment or cure. Uh, how and when do you think it will become accessible? Thank you. No, no, la, la, la domanda è grazie Thank you very much per, for the question. Fatta. The question is absolutely legitimate, and I think uh, that the problem of the cost of medicine and cancer medicine and of targeted drugs uh, is, uh, and smart drugs, is something that has to be solved at a social level. The cost of the new drugs is very, very high. The drug companies continue to say that it's because they invest a lot and because it's very expensive uh, to develop drugs. Yes, it is true, th but you can negotiate uh, an accessible cost. Um, I also would like to remind you uh, that um, drugs, uh, after a certain number of years, uh, the patent um, uh, is no longer covered. The cost at that point uh, drops. Uh, and this is w w true that uh, targeted or smart drugs are very expensive, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, and it is also true that these drugs uh, are misused uh, because, for example, by definition, a targeted drug must be used in patients who respond to it. Uh, but I think uh, that the uh, process whereby we develop these uh, and the fact that they go off patent uh, will make it possible for us uh, if we really want to be cynical, since it lasts 20 years, in 20 years all these new drugs uh, uh, will be off patent. Uh, and in 20 years, surely we will have understood where, when and for whom it works, uh, and therefore the cost uh, will shrink, uh, both for the national health system and also for the insurance-based uh, health system. It is certainly true that uh, uh, the ultra-precise medicine is expensive, uh, but it is also true that the, the uh, 
to sequence a genome is $300. $300 is nothing compared to an X-ray or a blood test. Uh, and that will be, I think, incorporated in the medical practice uh, routinely. And the cost of the drugs uh, will drop by definition because, as I said, they will be off patent. And then it'll be up to national governments uh, to negotiate the cost of drugs because, as you know, and maybe you've heard, you will have had guests, uh, the national health systems have the right to negotiate the appropriate price uh, for their citizens, uh, and they can, in fact, refuse to take a drug if the price is too high. Now, clearly, this creates a big tension, but uh, it is uh, an approach uh, that uh, can be followed. We're talking about uh, politics of health policies or two, and uh, the question is very important. I'll give you one example. In cystic fibrosis, uh, there are some drugs um, that uh, don't work very well, but are very, very expensive. Uh, the British uh, health system refused uh, to approve the drug, and therefore it doesn't u offer it uh, because uh, is trying to force uh, the drug company, which is called Vertex, uh, to lower costs. But I am optimistic uh, because I'm convinced that we will find, when the drug is effective, we will find a compromise. Uh, and the scientific challenge is to understand where and for what it works. Because if we're going to spend $250,000 per year, but we're going to treat cancer, well, I would spend it. But if we're going to spend $250,000 to uh, have an extra two months of life, is not worth it. So the goal is that to find drugs uh, that are curative, not just treatment, uh, when we will negotiate the cost there and then. But uh, this approach, uh, such as the Mospital, makes it possible to create uh, very rapidly copies of the tumor, which means that you can reduce the time and also the cost. Well, time, surely, because we certainly we get to know things much earlier. But uh, as you were saying, the cost uh, is the cost determined by the drug company. The cost of the hospital is nothing compared to the clinical trial. What I would like you to understand is when you use that platform, which I showed you, you're reducing costs. Uh, for the discovery of new drugs. Uh, but what uh, the problem is uh, that if the drug is approved, uh, it will be very expensive. But that is something uh, which uh, pertains more to policies and politics and health public or private uh, health policies. Yes, in the last uh, few words, uh, I picked up something which is greatly discussed and has been in recent times. There are drugs that are extremely expensive that belong, I think, uh, to the chem traditional chemotherapies, although they're not entirely traditional, that are used uh, at very high cost to extend uh, life by a few weeks in patients uh, who, unfortunately, are already doomed. And uh, in this, uh, there is a big debate. Is it meaningful or not to administer those drugs? Maybe we should also create uh, in people, the fact that people should be more aware of this. So that is to say, thinking that uh, to extend by a few weeks uh, or even a month uh, a life may be very important because in the course of that month you may make some decisions which have to do with maybe your children or your grandchildren or your partner and so on. But uh, possibly there is a balance to be found uh, so without saying that you have to deny that type of treatment, probably you have to consider that cost, uh, comparing it to others uh, that are investments. Uh, what you're saying is very right, but what I would like to remind you of uh, is that all that we're trying to do is to try and understand which patients react very well, not just which patients react a bit better. We're not interested in that. That might interest uh, the drug companies because they'll sell more drugs. Uh, but all the effort in playing chess with cancer is, uh, if I want to show you the data, there are patients who react very well, patients who do not react at all, and patients who react a little bit. The question is, uh, 
what about the why do the ones who really respond why and those who don't uh, and I would use these expensive uh, these expensive drugs only in the ones uh, that react uh, or respond very well while for instance give all patients uh, indiscriminately may not even sequencing their gene to see if they have the right uh, a uh, drug that costs $250,000 uh, is uh, not uh, a wise decision in terms of the government or policies. And very encouraging thing is uh, that uh, if it costs a few hundreds euros or dollars, uh, the first one costs three and a half billion. So think of how much uh, the price has dropped uh, and it required 10 years work. Well, the idea is clear to you all. The idea of the drug, which is uh, no long patented, the, when it's off patent, the price uh, drops 10, 100 folds. 100, aspirin is a case in point. Yes, uh, malice, for example, the technique uh, to sequence rapidly was, in, was PCR. Between uh, one uh, whiff of uh, drug and the other, uh, that's what he produced. Now, I'll take advantage uh, to ask you. You were suggesting that we should uh, visit uh, the hospital in Boston, and you said it looks a bit like Turin, but it's Boston. And in Italy? In Italy, we can do it. It's uh, a project of mine. We can do it in Turin. Why not? We've got plenty of mice here, and uh, there's also the facility, but jokes apart, uh, this uh, itinerary, this uh, journey is totally exportable or can be imported and as an Italian, as I feel and am, I will try to do so in Italy and to bring to Italy not just the approach but also the drugs because the thing which distinguishes in this moment, at this moment, uh, apart from funding research, uh, don't uh, I don't want to say the usual things because clearly the Americans invest more in research, but what is very important and which is the difference between the US and Europe is that in the US they do more clinical trials. Not only do we need the infrastructure, but also a gateway to take these new trials from the US to Europe and Italy in particular, and I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to bring Harvard to Italy and our know-how and our experience, and also to have a hospital. Tanto complimenti per il suo lavoro e per la sua ricerca. Io vorrei farle una domanda. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for your work and for your research. I would like to ask you a question which refers to some of the slides that you were showing. You presented a modification of the genome and you spoke about these cancer cells that metastasis produce them. I've always had a curiosity. We know that cells reproduce through osmotic processes with that we have a passage of electric charges through the cell membrane. We also know that the cell membrane has a, an electric potential which is roughly between minus uh, 40 and mace, minus 80 millivolt. In research, we've seen that uh, we have a mutation of uh, this uh, cell membrane when cells uh, recognize, are recognized as uh, being cancer cells or being in, with cancer since this evening we spoke about smart drugs, I would like to know whether if instead of using drugs to fight uh, the neoplastic cell, the cancer cell, uh, which has already got metastases, uh, so we already have uh, this uh, uh, genome that has been altered and grown, would it not be possible to find the smart drugs uh, acting on the receptors of the membrane in the uh, passage of the nourishment of this cell so as to act before the cell enters the uh, metastasis process or cycle. That is to say, act with the smart drugs on the mitochondria 
that are contained in our cytoplasm and in our cell? Have you never thought of acting so deeply so as to uh, br bring the electric potential back to normal levels so that this cell does not progress? Thank you. What you're saying is very important, and this is something we're doing. We're doing it also in my lab. One of the things that is very fashionable now is to understand not only what you're saying, that is to say the potentials and the physical features of the cell, but also the metabolic features part of the cell, that is to say, the metabolic nature, that is to say, what do these cells uh, use as nourishment and to use it uh, uh, to our advantage to develop uh, drugs uh, that uh, would block uh, this uh, type of uh, metabolism. We already know that uh, cancer metabolism is altered. We've known it uh, for a century now, we've known it. Uh, because cancer cells use glucose or sugar in a completely different manner. And this is why there is a section of uh, oncology which is uh, called oncometabolism. And this uh, has uh, led to the discovery of important drugs and which are leading us uh, not only to understand what the cell needs, uh, the cancer cell, for example, to produce uh, metastases. We've, un we've understood recently that the metastatic process is favored by lipids. That is to say, if you eat uh, lipids or you have more in the blood, the cancer cell will use it uh, and this will increase its metastatic ability. So this uh, branch of oncology will make it possible not only for us to find metabolic drugs, but above all, it will make it possible to go back to previous uh, issues, how we can prevent cancer, because so surely there are some uh, food nutrients, uh, some food which is more or less, uh, which more or less will favor the transformation. Now we knew, for example, that sugar is uh, one of, the sugars uh, are one of these, uh, because all the pathways, uh, the signal pathways that the cancer uses uh, are based uh, on the control, the energy control which uh, sugar gives us. We'd understood this. Uh, and we understood it years ago, which is why the last thing I will say in this respect is that the idea of having a, a personalized cancer treatment can also be accompanied and will be accompanied by a very detailed knowledge of what a patient with that cancer preferably should eat or should not eat, and that there should be a personalized diet for a cancer patient, not only because, uh, as you know, they lose weight and very complex problem, but also to attack the cancer itself, using this type of knowledge to our advantage. Now, I would like to ask you, first of all, describing the drug, you spoke about the fact that it was arsenic acid and that there was a curiosity in the other part, which was a derivative of vitamin A. Yes. Yes, you understood perfectly well. The interesting thing, the very interesting thing of this uh, is uh, that uh, with the leukemia, but the, both drugs are traditional drugs, if we wish uh, to define them as such. They're not uh, drug company ones. They're a patent. They were used uh, in uh, the pharma, ancient pharmacopoeia by the Chinese. The Chinese and the ancient Romans realized that, that the trioxide arsenic, uh, which is uh, the one which will kill you if you take it at a very high doses. Uh, at low doses is a very powerful anti-cancer drug. We've discovered that the Romans used arsenic in leukemia. That is to say they'd understood what we have proven and that this is a drug. And while the other one, which is also a traditional drug, of uh, the Chinese pharmacopoeia is a derivative of vitamin A. Vitamin A is the one in tomatoes, for instance, uh, and it is ironical that these discoveries on leukemia uh, was in Italy, and as you know, we eat a lot of tomatoes. Uh, now, we have proven that uh, 
this uh, derivative of vitamin A, which has no side effects uh, because it is absolutely well tolerated, is extremely effective in this type of leukemia, and we've understood why. And I could speak to you for hours about why, but you'll have to believe me. But to say it in a nutshell, we've shown that these two drugs, uh, which are not very toxic because at very low doses of arsenic, uh, are extremely effective in the treatment uh, and cure of leukemia. And to go back to the cost, for example, the cost is virtually nothing. Well, this has become more complicated because drugs uh, must be Some are patented, so the cost is high simply because the drug company says that they spent a lot of money to make them. But uh, the drug also has a cost because they have to be manufactured, uh, produced. So uh, retinoic acid and arsenic have a cost, a manufacturing cost, but it's a very low cost because uh, thanks to God, they're natural drugs. Uh, and uh, the story is uh, very interesting because it's the convergence of a traditional medicine and a group of scientists that realized uh, what the medicine and mechanisms uh, were and why they would work. Uh, and we then proved their effectiveness in the animal model. But this uh, makes it possible for us uh, to suggest that there are a series of natural drugs uh, that we have to test in cancer. And the hospital makes it possible for us to do this because as a platform we can use uh, American Novartis experimental drugs, we can experiment them all. In theory, all the natural drugs are to see if they have an effect because the platform is such uh, that we can rapidly test them very well. And that is a an area that we could do develop in Italy, and it's extremely interesting because as a national health system, it means the cost could drop. Uh, to give an example, if we realize that aspirin works uh, in a specific type of cancer, well, aspirin is virtually cost zero, so we need to find cheaper drugs. And the second question is if there are any types of cancer which are more difficult to fight, and if so, which ones? That's a very important question, and the answer is unfortunately very easy. There are some, to date, two cancers uh, that uh, are killers, and uh, we're working. One is the pancreas, can cancer of the pancreas, and the other one is the brain. Luckily, the brain cancer is very rare. The pancreas one is not so rare, and um, it has an incidence that is increasing. And uh, I could uh, speculate as to why, but I think this has a lot to do with what we uh, eat and what we drink, uh, such as wine. But these two types of cancer are, to date, still fatal in most cases. Uh, but the novelty is uh, that we're desperately trying to create vaccines. I told you that immune therapy is uh, developing, is growing, and preliminary data are very encouraging. So both in the neoblastoma in the brain and in the cancer of the pancreas, uh, immune therapies or vaccines uh, could be a very effective manner both of preventing and curing. But to date, unfortunately, These two types of cancer, in spite of the fact that we know a lot about it, in spite of the fact uh, that we read the 2% uh, book, uh, in, the, in spite of the fact that we know uh, how the uh, genome has mutated, is very difficult because uh, you're working. It's very difficult to accessible. One, because it's in our skull and clearly between the hematoencephalic barrier and the other one because it's in our abdomen. But uh, you have a sort of screen, in this case, and not a chemical one, but a physical one, a sort of physical barrier, which is uh, very difficult to penetrate by drugs. So they become tumors that are very difficult to treat because they're malignant, but also very difficult to access. We're going to close it, but I still have one more question. Since we spoke about sport, uh, Pier Paolo Pandolfi, not once, but twice, was launching a baseball ball. Tell me if it's true. Yes, it's true. On the Red Sox uh, that are a mythical baseball team. Yes, this is very amusing, and it is true. And 
the beauty of Boston. In Boston, scientists, or an American, but in Boston this is even more so because it's a university city par excellence. Scientists are heroes. Uh, if they do something good, uh, so the teams, uh, baseball teams, football teams, uh, want to honor the heroes of science. Uh, and so there's this big baseball team, which is uh, the equivalent of Juventus in Boston, that won a lot of championships. Uh, and they created a Hall of Fame, a sort of group of uh, excellent scientists and so on. That honor, they honor, and they give them the initial bat, as if in football you were called to start the ball rolling Juventus Milan or Juventus Torino, and uh, you, the scientist, is the one that gives the first one. And the, the fact is uh, that in the screen of the stadium where you normally see the, go the goals, the scoring, they have uh, a five minutes uh, of a documentary on the life of the scientist that is being honored. And all these 80,000 fans look at this video, and then they all imagine you, what it happens in the stadium. They explode in a, they clap, and you go down on the field, and you start the ball rolling. But in baseball, this is the pitch. And the pitch, you know, is when you, you throw the ball. Now, if you've never been in a baseball one, this pitch, which seems as very simple, is not at all simple because the batter is very far away. So when they did uh, that, I had to give me a pitcher. I didn't know anything about baseball. I spent a summer uh, like a nightmare because I had to buy a baseball ball and then go on with my daughters. I was uh, training to try and reach at least the batter because it was humiliating if you uh, throw the ball and it drops there. In the end, I managed just, uh, and I did it twice. Uh, they honored me twice, which is an honor, but also a nightmare, but it's true. Thank you very much. Well, the second time you were already trained, the second time I was less emotional about it. Right, fine. We thank you very much. And we thank you all. And thank you, Pierpaolo Pandolfi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.